Good evening and welcome to the final session of the Creative Communities Culture Conference. This conference has been presented by the Cultural Alliance in the heart of Georgian Bay with the support of Rogers TV. My name is Fred Hacker and I'll be your host this evening. As I mentioned, the eight evenings of this conference have been presented by the Cultural Alliance in the heart of Georgian Bay, which represents the Beausoleil First Nation, the towns of Midland and Penetanguishene, and the townships of Tay and Tiny. We recognize that the region represented by the Cultural Alliance is located on land which is the traditional and treaty territory of the Chippewas of Lakes Huron and Simcoe, now known as Chippewa Tri-Council, which composes Beausoleil First Nation, Rama First Nation, and the Georgina Islands First Nation. This territory is within the Pre-Confederation Treaties 5, 16, and 18, and included within the Williams Treaties of 1923. We also recognize that the region is located on land which was once the territory of the Huron-Wendat, and that our communities are home to many citizens of the Métis Nation of Ontario and to a large and diverse community of Indigenous peoples. We're grateful to the sponsors of this conference. The sponsors for this evening's session are CIBC, Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce Midland Branch, and the Midland Copy Shop. We express our thanks to them for making this program possible, and we hope you'll have the opportunity to thank them as well. We also express our gratitude to Simcoe County Tourism for their conference sponsorship and to Rogers TV for their technical support. Throughout the conference, we've attempted to identify the obstacles and the challenges facing the creative economy, both for individuals and for organizations and institutions. We have attempted to lay out some preliminary steps towards confronting and overcoming those obstacles and challenges. We've also been aware that the current circumstances offer some unique opportunities for those in the creative economy. So we've tried to identify those opportunities and to provide guidelines on how to recognize and benefit from such opportunities. This evening, we're gonna try and review the events of the past month. There have been two parts to each evening's activities. The first hour has featured presentations by three panelists, followed by a discussion between those panelists and a moderator. The second hour each evening was devoted to discussion between the panelists and the audience. For those of you viewing this program at a later date, you will have only seen the first hour of each presentation. You will have not seen the discussion with the audience each evening. So this evening, we're going to provide summaries of all the sessions. One of our leaders will be providing to you a summary of the first hour when we had panelist presentations and discussion, and a second leader will summarize the issues raised in the second hour with the audience. You'll remember that our first evening, November 3rd, featured our keynote speaker, Catherine Nichols. Catherine is the chair of the New York State Council on the Arts. She launched our conference by addressing the subject of recovery from a major setback. Catherine was a business leader for a luxury brand in New York City, when the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center occurred. She told us how her company helped the city's recovery and then pivoted to recover its own market. She was also a business leader when the 2008 recession hit, decimating the lifestyle publication business where she then worked. Again, she portrayed how she became CEO and brought that business back stronger than ever after that setback. Her message was one of hope and of resolve for all the creatives who were already experiencing challenges and then dealt a heavy blow by the coronavirus pandemic. Each of the ensuing evenings focused on the obstacles and opportunities presented in this current situation. On November 5th, we looked at how to get started on the road to success. On November 10th, we discussed marketing and audience building. On November 12th, we investigated financing options. On November 17th, we dealt with traditions. On November 19th, we explored mentoring, collaborating, and partnering. And finally, on November 24th, we reviewed the obstacles and opportunities presented by technology. Now let's hear from those presenters from each of the sessions as they summarize those events. 
Getting started on the path to success was the subject of our panel discussion in the Creative Communities Culture Conference. It was designed to identify the obstacles and challenges facing the creative economy through the lens of individuals and organizations and to lay out some preliminary steps to confront and overcome those obstacles and challenges. I was one of the panelists with Don Bourne and was facilitated by Cher Cunningham. I think the headline of this discussion was the need to start fresh and see opportunity with new eyes. The panelists came into the session knowing everyone wanted the answer. An answer, any answer for the challenges that they have been facing and for a way to move forward. However, the recommendations centered around the need to appreciate what, that while the world has fundamentally shifted, the first step is to go back to the basics. A foundational strategy is key. All businesses need to articulate three things, what it offers, why it's important, and to whom the ideal customer. Without understanding what, why, and who, you cannot build a plan for how you will get your offer to them. There is no one answer to these questions, and there's no one right answer. So the key is to spend the time answering each of them. Exploring these questions will build the fundamentals that are the first step in your path forward. Our brains are not working in our favor right now. On a good day, humans don't deal well with ambiguity. So in a crisis, it's that much harder. We want and need the answers to move forward, but in a crisis, our brains react with a biologically driven fight, freeze, or flight mode. Know what that feels like? Are you a deer in the headlights or someone running for cover? Well, if so, you're not alone. This is key in order to set, reassess the situation and create a new plan. We need to trick our brains into seeing opportunity instead of reacting to the threats. I work with leadership teams every day to help their brains upshift from those very human reactions to critical and creative thinking. Panelist Don Bourne is a mentor to entrepreneurs and he encouraged creators to learn from their audiences and stakeholders to ensure they position their offer to address those audience needs. We want you to watch the complete session, but the top line included these things. First, adopt a beginner's mind. Don't start with the answer and look for those questions that will help you break through with new ideas. So be curious, ask questions to really understand your audience's life experiences and point of view. Reach out to all the stakeholders, seek to understand their needs and how what you have to offer can provide them value. You can look to past customers, partners, collaborators, competitors as a starting point to identify your unique value. And then spend some time to uniquely articulate the benefits you provide. Each of these suggestions will take you from stuck to started and getting started on that new path in these new and challenging times. I always say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So start by vividly describing that new road and new vision. Because if you can't visualize it, you won't be able to create it. With this as a guiding mission, you can take it one step at a time from there and move from obstacle to opportunity. I hope you enjoyed the session. Hi, I'm Cher Cunningham. It was my privilege to host the second evening of the Creative Communities Culture Conference. The theme of that evening was getting started on the path to success. It was sponsored by the Newton Street Art Barn and the Midland Cultural Centre. I hope that you'll be able to support them back in the coming months. We thank you so much for engaging with us in this evening. After the first hour with the panel, we then moved into a breakout session in which we were able to chat with some of the people who are participating, some of the audience members, and hear their questions and concerns, as well as some of the ideas that they wanted to share. During that hour, there were about three main themes that came out of that. First of all, getting back to basics, really figuring out your value and your value proposition. Collaboration with your colleagues, your competition with associations. And thirdly, reaching out for help, being able to ask for help now more than ever. The help is there. You just need to find where it is. So we have some ideas for you in the next few minutes. So first we expanded on that basic need. What is the value that you bring? Often an artisan or creative can forget that it isn't just that they are passionate about what they do. The people who purchase their products are a little bit passionate back and the value that you bring is still the same as it was pre-COVID. So as we explored value, a question came up of how do we build our 
value proposition when we relate it to our artist statement. So your artist statement, the story behind your art, uh, why you chose and work in this medium, what message or emotion you're evoking with a piece, uh, that is part of your value, right? Because your story becomes the story of the piece as well. So a video sharing how you work where your inspiration comes from, maybe even a demonstration or showing some work on the piece you're about to sell. You can get very creative about how you bring story into your value proposition. As Catherine Nichols said in the opening keynote, the arts tell our story. They also bring us into the story, involve us in your story, the story of the piece, the story of the artist, and they add to our own story. They provide conversation starters and connection to the artist and to the story that you are telling. Next, what resources are available to pull you out of isolation and find strength and positivity in those in the numbers, right? There's always strength in numbers. So how do we find that when we don't have those opportunities to meet and mingle like we used to? Well, this includes finding opportunities to collaborate. So look at those organizations that you used to work with in the past. They're probably struggling too, as they try to come up with ways to capture attention in this incredibly online world that we are in these days. Offer to partner with them on virtual events or socially distanced in-person events and bring your energy and ideas to their efforts too. Maybe they're just waiting to see or hoping that others will reach out as they sit in their virtual and Zoom meetings trying to figure out how to move forward, especially coming into the holiday season. So reach out to cultural organizations, libraries, associations, see what gaps that they need to have filled, and maybe you'll find that synergy that you can bring to a project. Take advantage of other people's lists. There are people out there who have been online promoting their influencers who have been sharing and inspiring people for years prior to COVID shutdown. If you're trying to build your list on your own right now, that can be incredibly daunting. Instead, look at who already is talking to your client, maybe on social media, maybe through their website, through their events calendar that they've moved into a social online platform. Have a peek at that. A couple of those came up during our session. So one of them is our session sponsor, Newton Street Art Barn. They'll sell on consignment your products. They'll also sell them online or in store. They'll even promote your workshop. So if you're thinking, I'm gonna give it a shot on doing an online workshop, rather than starting from scratch or reaching out just to your group on Facebook or Instagram, why not reach out to other people's lists as well? Alison Dirtnall, I'm a professor at Georgian College and I was on the panel for the session that was called Opportunities and Obstacles, Building Audiences and Finding Markets. I was on the panel with Gavin Reynolds from Facebook and with Mike Adams from Stratford and Will Baird was the moderator from Huronia Historical Parks. So here's a little recap of some of the things that we discussed. We started with a discussion about the foundations of marketing and the different ways that you could put together your marketing plan, regardless of how big or how small your business is. So I went through some of the details around creating your target market, deciding on what your objective is, uh, developing your brand proposition, and then leading into your promotional plan and the different ways you could promote your business. And then uh, Mike from Stratford, he talked about the hearts and minds of theater goers and the reasons why people go to uh, theater type live events. And he talked about the different ways that um, Stratford and other companies have developed online platforms to stay, to keep engaged with the audience, even though they can't have these events in person now. And he had some fabulous recommendations for um, all the people listening in to that session. And then Gavin talked about taking the time to learn and to test and to educate yourself with the things that probably you've been putting off and that this is a great opportunity now to start to dig in and learn uh, some of these things, perhaps around digital and social media marketing that you've been meaning to do. And he talked about a lot of the different resources and where to find that information 
to help you uh, with that learning. He talked about doing a digital audit too, which was an excellent idea. So looking at what you're doing now, who's engaging uh, with your media, what's working, what's not working, and that can help you to set the stage for developing your plan going forward. So we had a great discussion. I hope you can take the time to review the recording of the entire uh, discussion and took away lots of learning from it. Hi everyone, my name is Gavin Reynolds. I'm an operations and enablement lead at Facebook. I recently had the privilege of participating in the opportunities and obstacles, building audiences and finding markets panel, along with Alison Dirtnell from Georgian College, Mike Adams from Stratford, and our moderator, Will Baird. During the first hour, we had a tremendous roundtable. Allison really focused on the foundations of effective marketing. Mike really talked a lot about the hearts and minds of theater goers um, and how places like Stratford are using online platforms to continue to drive engagement during the pandemic. And I focused a little bit on the opportunity that presents itself um, when things do slow down and how you can leverage this time to brush up on your skills and educate yourself to really become a more effective marketer um, to support your business as part of your reimagination merge plan um, post pandemic. During the second hour, we had a fantastic Q&A with everyone who was in attendance. Um, Allison really provided some great recommendations around um, setting a clear vision for your brand and the importance of how you can set yourself apart from the competition. She also provided some recommendations on how you can leverage the technical expertise of things like college students who are looking to um, assist businesses, um, especially great for, for those of you who are, are maybe looking for a little bit of technical expertise if you're lacking it right now. Um, that's a, a great resource that Allison touched on. I talked a lot about some online e-learning modules and free resources that are available to support that education that I had talked about. Um, and then we had some great questions around the challenges of small business owners who maybe don't have a dedicated website or e-commerce platform to sell their goods and how they can leverage things like uh, Marketplace and uh, free online forums to promote and sell their products, as well as how they can quickly and easily set up um, an e-commerce um, site for their products through things like Etsy and Shopify. The bulk of the questions, I would say, were probably directed towards uh, Mike. Um, there was, I think, a ton of value for this group in hearing his perspective as someone who is in a position where he is no longer able to actually get people in the theater um, experiencing um, live performances. Um, it was really also, I think, valuable for the group to hear his perspective as to how they have adapted to these challenges and how they are coping during the pandemic and really finding new ways to engage with their consumer base. Um, it was also also uh, really good for him to share his perspective on how the creators and performers themselves have been coping um, and really trying to understand um, the Stratford plan for how they are planning to kind of reemerge from all of this um, post pandemic. It was a really great discussion, um, lots of great questions from those who were in attendance. So thank you if you were. Um, I hope you get the chance to watch it and enjoy it. Um, and thanks again for tuning in. Hello, my name is Avril Helbig. I'm a development specialist who participated in the fourth evening of the Creative Communities Culture Conference on November 12th. The topic of our session that evening was solving the money problem, accessing sources of financial support. And the other participants were David Barnard, a senior program advisor for the Canada Arts Presentation Fund with the Department of Canadian Heritage from the Ontario region and Monica Hanada, who has a background in arts advocacy and education uh, that eventually took her into sponsorship and fundraising uh, during her time with an organization called Business for the Arts. Um, the moderator for our session was Chantal Gagnon, who's a regional development advisor for the Ontario Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, and Culture Industries. Uh, during the first hour, our roundtable addressed issues about the types of funding, availability of resources, and the best way to access it. I gave an overview of funders at the federal, provincial, and local levels, as well as some information around the categories of funding, things like are you looking for project funding, capacity building funding, core operating capital funds, what do the categories of funding mean? We also talked about COVID funding and COVID supports right now. Then I talk briefly about emerging directions in funding, talking about the policy frameworks that underlie grants and government programs. Some of these included 
export strategies, anti-racism and multiculturalism issues, new opportunities for indigenous communities and creators, and digital strategies and projects. I talk briefly about the thought process that an individual or an organization goes through when considering funding and some of the rationales, approaches, and even mindsets that can be both positive and negative for those things. Next up was David Barnard from Heritage, who gave an overview of the history of that ministry, including its mandate. He spoke about the programs that the ministry offers, how the ministry is structured and where responsibilities lie. David had a lot of great insight into how to access and make connections with program officers who are often your best allies in the quest for government support. He also talked uh, briefly about the new Indigenous Language Act. Monica Hanada up next spoke about her experience in the Toronto Office of Business and the Arts and her experience with advocacy across Ontario. Her focus was on partnership development and relationship development within communities. Monica spoke about alternative and cross-platform fundraising in the digital sphere, including demonstrating some event and development platforms and resources that are really useful like uh, Tiltify, Patreon, and Twitch. She highly endorsed the Alyssa Influencer Fundraising Podcast as a great resource for learning about community building and relationship and sponsorship building. During our panelist roundtable discussion, we spoke about how getting money is a job in itself and, and getting the depth of information you need can be hard. All of us agreed that picking up the phone and talking to people is the key to accelerating the process of learning. We talked about the different values funders have and how building relationships with them means you have a better chance of being successful with your applications. David and Chantal pointed out that funders are talking and sharing information more than ever, and they emphasize their business, uh, yeah, business sources for funding as well as support for creative projects, which a lot of artists don't consider. Monica talked about engaging social media support with campaigns and alternative ways to connect. We all came together to talk about partnership building and how projects which come from the outside of major centers are very important. And finally, we talked about who are allies on the ground for not-for-profits, including board members and audiences. This session was a great overview of why, how, and when to apply for public funding from a variety of perspectives. Our second hour featured a Q&A where participants talked through some of their particular challenges with current projects, and they asked detailed questions about processes and sources. I hope you enjoyed this important session, Solving the Money Problem, Accessing Sources of Financial Support, and Good Luck with Your Own Projects. For our session in the Creative Communities Cultural Conference, our panel was about solving the money problem, accessing sources of financial support. So in our session, we concluded that you don't often see one person being successful on their own. Usually there's a community and multiple other people that you see behind that you don't see behind the scenes helping that individual reach success or that organization reach success. So what that individual or that organization has done in that journey to become successful is they have figured out new and innovative ways to stay connected and involved. So one of the biggest innovative ways to stay connected and involved is to look at how you can grow your community. So a good way to do that is empowering your stakeholders. So either your audience in your municipality or just anyone involved in your direct community and bringing them in as stakeholders of your organization or your project or artistic endeavor that you're taking on at that time. This will then help those projects become a little more manageable because it's a lot for one person or maybe one organization with very few staff to attempt to take on all this on their own. So what that will do as well is it'll help create more ownership, buy-in, and support from your community to help more strongly support a municipality in turn. So it'll help you just take that artistic endeavor or project to the next step and just show everyone why that buy-in is important so you can get it to the level that you want to achieve. So a good way to go about getting started in this is searching in your municipality 
or your online community for associations, um, anything of that sort, business improvement areas, or a coalition of corporate champions. Pitching to your community to bring in someone from a municipality or a community that has already successfully done that and figuring out how you can adapt that model to your own so you can adapt that success and experience that within your community. Also, another huge way of accessing additional financial support is thinking about how sponsorship is connected to community as well. So not only relying on government funding, but also thinking in your, municipal in your municipality when you're seeking sponsorship, you're not just seeking out to fund your own one project. You're also looking and seeing how you can help the business or sponsor who you're partnering with. So it could be bringing them in and having their voice impact your artistic endeavor as well. Or it can be sitting down with them and seeing how what you will do will impact them and their business and figuring out what help you need from them to make that final goal happen. So there's a lot of different ways to reach that, obviously. It's sitting down with people. It could be just researching businesses online or businesses in your community. It could be researching existing projects that are happening online where you see a fit for your project to be involved in as well. But I would say one of the best ways to get started is just to do a little bit of research online and see who's currently operating projects and who has a mandate similar to what you're aiming to achieve in your project that you're thinking of at the time and to pair up with anyone who's like-minded just to amplify the success of both of you and hopefully eventually lead to new financial sources that you wouldn't have seen earlier. Hello everyone. My name is Father Michael Knox and I'm the director of Martyr Shrine in Tay Township. Recently I had the honor of participating in Creative Communities Culture Conference, uh, which was an event of several days that I hope that you enjoyed. And I've been asked as a panel member to offer a brief note of reflections of the section that I participated in called Obstacles and Opportunities in Tradition, Transitioning to Pathways of Success. I was honored to uh, be accompanied on this panel by two incredible women, Wanda Nanabush, who is the inaugural curator of Indigenous art and co-lead of the Indigenous and Canadian Art Department of the Art Gallery of Ontario, and Joelle Roy, or Wa, uh, as director of La Fontaine's Festival de Loup, which she has helped to foster and grow into a regional success. The conversation we had was extraordinary. We were reflecting on the notion of tradition and what the role of tradition is within each of our institutions, whether it be a heritage site or for the person, the artist who's involved in the craft of bringing something forward to share in our community. We began with Joelle and her point that tradition can be a double-edged sword. On the one side, it forms a balance and stability uh, in a cultural environment that helps in the expression of that culture's creativity, whilst at the same time, it can act as a hindrance or perhaps an albatross that can hold an institution or person back in their efforts to be creative. Also, Wanda Nanabush presented beautiful narratives uh, regarding various traditions within various First Nations cultures and highlighted the importance of those traditions being held in the authors and also reminded us of the important fact that the larger historical colonial project into present day has sadly worked hard in different ways to cut that culture of the Indigenous people. And yet, if you'll forgive me in a sense, with a resurrection, this culture is finding new ways of expression through art, through music, through dance, and through visual means. This conversation that we shared together also included my own uh, reflection on tradition, where I highlighted that tradition reflects deep human realities that need expression and come to the fore, deep truths perhaps of the good or what is beautiful or most meaningful or moral for a society. These come into customs and those customs become blessed or identified as traditions 
And these traditions are not necessarily always changing, but deepening within an institution, within a people, within a society. As we moved into the question period, it was incredible. The conversation uh, was really something where I learned a lot. And some of the questions asked were, for example, what is the effect of space, uh, geographic or psychological or prayerful or sociopolitical, the space around which traditions come and where we sit in our journey as persons in becoming who it is we feel called to be as expressed through these different traditions, whether it be in an art, craft, or music, and dance, etc. We also spent some time, based on one question, reflecting on the importance of respecting different traditions as artists, as we in some ways appropriate or perhaps are inspired by different art forms and want to incorporate them in our own. Particular attention to that kind of care needs to be placed in our age, particularly in the Canadian context, around Indigenous art and culture, but any form of art, uh, culture, or religion that we're interacting with and wish to bring into our own creative process. Overall, it was a wonderful evening, and as I said, I learned a lot. I really want to thank uh, Wanda and Joelle for the opportunity to be with them, and of course, our intrepid leader in the discussion, asking poignant questions, uh, Fred Hacker. I hope that this gives you a taste of what we experienced, and I hope that for those who in participated in the conference, that it was an enriching experience for you. Thank you so much. November 17th session was all about traditions, cleverly directed by the one and only Fred Hacker. Wanda Nana Bush, Father Michael Knox, and myself, Joël Roy, enjoyed this, uh, the enlightening uh, discussion that followed our exposés. Started with Tom, who opened the discussion with the concept of space, as evoked by the German poet Rilke and also the French philosopher Bachelard, as in the space of becoming, the house of the future opposed to the house of our childhood. We were then asked, are we going back to what was? I said, no, <laughs> there is no coming back because we are transformed by this experience. Wanda says she doesn't want to go back to a life that destroyed the planet. Father Michael talked about the resurgence of a new world after this time of reflection. During the pandemic, we are experimenting an increase of art appreciation. People discover galleries, museums, performances they had never attended to before. Wanda noticed how people understand more the importance of the arts. Fred adds that a study shows how people's creativity has increased during these times. Having to re redirect our performances, showing and teaching online, allowed us to reach an audience way beyond our territory. Wanda mentioned how at the Ontario Art Gallery, the registration for workshops raised to an unprecedented high volume. Then Chantal challenged us with the cultural appropriation danger. I was happy to hear it because with all that has happened in the last while, as an organizer who seeks to include more French Métis culture in our festival, I have become totally paranoid. Wanda points out towards a resource that could be a very good starting point. Apita Wikosikan, we will write it for you, uh, .com, it's a website. Also look for Chelsea Vowell, V-O-W-E-L. She uh, is in that website I just mentioned, and she also has a blog. So these could be a good starting point to understand the challenge uh, to intercultural sharing which is through human relationship, and education is the key. To end this, uh, the discussion, Fred brings us towards the younger generation, 
how do youth learn traditions? My response is quite basic. They need to be included in every step of the way, including planning. This allowed us to finish on a very bright comment. Wanda expressed how the young indigenous generation is the first one without shame. They might be the most traditional of all. For those who seek more theory on the tradition subject, Claude Levi Strauss has a theory on tradition and ritual as pointed out by Thom. Thank you for listening. In our session, number six, we discussed collaboration, partnerships, and mentoring in the creative economy. And for the first hour, we offered a number of solutions uh, and discussions regarding these issues. Uh, I, Jamie Hunter, was the moderator, and, and discussants were John French, who discussed collaboration, John Hartman, who discussed mentoring, and Fred Hacker, who presented uh, on partnerships. Under the category of collaborations, John presented a number of ways to develop collaborations. Um, they could lead to new audiences, unique and creative funding opportunities, and quite frankly, many intangible benefits as a result of developing a collaborative relationship. You need to create a mandate and work towards achieving the cultural experiences expected through the collaboration. With respect to mentorship, John Hartman discussed the ways and means of developing mentorships. He noted that Quest Galleries in, uh, has a program to encourage mentorship through the Midland Cultural Center. Job des John described the value of mentoring for the new artist, as well as the many benefits to the old artist uh, in terms of uh, a mentoring process. Um, the seminar as well um, established um, the benefits for the established artist, which most mentorships don't really address. He also noted that his mentor, Andy Trudeau, wasn't actually an artist, but rather provided uh, John with the ability to survive in the Northland. And so this mentorship enabled John to go out and become a better artist. Uh, in terms of partnerships, Fred Hacker presented a review of why two or more parties need to create partnerships. He reviewed the many obstacles and challenges as a way that a business would share both the profits and the losses. So you need a clear written plan whereby the two or more parties discuss and agree on the deliverables of a potential partnership. Similar to a marriage, you had to work hard, communicate effectively, um, and prepare a written document to succeed in the concepts of partnerships. In essence, um, partnerships can be viewed as much longer term relationships. Collaborations are usually shorter term relationships with a defined start and finish. And finally, mentoring can take place with creatives who tend to share the similar goals and concepts after all, cultural works in all their forms require discussion, purpose, and written descriptions of what is expected of both parties. Hi, this is John Hartman. I'm here in my LaFontaine studio, and I'm um, going to give a brief uh, uh, summary of tonight's uh, discussion, collaboration, partnerships, and mentoring in the arts. Uh, at the very beginning of the hour, uh, both our panelists, in response to a question, uh, uh, Fred Hacker and John French had a chance to uh, talk about uh, the uh, nature of mentorships in their experience. John uh, French talked about how a uh, mentorship situation often evolves into a friendship of colleagues situation. 
uh, and that that in itself is uh, is very rewarding. Uh, and Fred uh, talked about how uh, how much he learned uh, w when he was being mentored by a senior lawyer in a in one of the Toronto law firms where he articled, and how it was there was it sometimes it seemed like there was an awful lot of work dumped on his lap but uh, in the end he understood how much he was learning from that. And we had a, uh, questions from uh, uh, Dan and uh, Michelle Paymont, uh, Dan Donaldson and Michelle Paymont, about um, the uh, difference between um, collaboration and partnerships and Michelle seemed very specifically wanting to come to some sort of understanding himself uh, about w w w what situations require more of a partnership uh, type uh, legal agreement before entering into them and which ones might require a less formal structure to the um, to the re relationship and I'm not sure that that um, Michelle got his his answer uh, but it but it 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 was sort of uh, fairly thoroughly discussed um, uh, um, among the um, uh, panelists. And um, there was a question from uh, Carol Hartwell on um, the uh, degree to which arts institutions and artists have started to use um, uh, online presentations in the time of COVID to um, supplement or in, in fact, and sometimes replace the uh, in-person experience, uh, especially uh, in art galleries. And so I had a chance to address that uh, question and um, uh, basically said that some institutions and some private galleries have really stepped forward and decided to um, uh, uh, bring a lot more professionalism to the creation of these videos and online uh, 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 programs that were being presented on their digital platforms and, and on their social media platforms and how they immediately saw the benefit of this in reaching out to a much larger audience and how it was likely in the future that this new way of doing things would be added on to the way things had previously been done once we move out of COVID. Uh, and then a question from... Um, Dan Donaldson about whether or not a cultural master plan for the area of Southern Georgian Bay would be desirable. Uh, uh, Fred Hacker took the opportunity to introduce Karen Mealing and um, uh, Cindy Hastings, uh, both of whom are involved with the, the Cultural Alliance, Cindy as the um, chair and uh, Karen as the staff person. And the interesting thing for me that came out of that is that Cindy says that the uh, Cultural Alliance is in the process of creating, doing a cultural mapping of the four municipalities, Tiny Tay, Pentatanguishene, Midland, or five municipalities, Bosley First Nation. Uh, and in response to my question, what would cultural mapping be? She said it would be the kind of thing where you're mapping out individual creative artists, the different venues that that show or that are involved in cultural activity, the events that are run, I suppose, like the Lef like the Festival de Lou in La Fontaine, and then uh, also a historical component that looks at um, you know things that have been made here in the past that aren't being made by people that are currently living. So I thought that would be very interesting, and I'm looking forward to seeing the cultural map because I think we're all individually aware of certain amount of activity but not of the overall activity not the not the extent of it and i think we'll be quite surprised by what we find from that and um the final comment uh, that uh, came from uh, joyce campbell who suggested that if we're looking for partnerships that we should be open to out-of-the-box partnerships uh, and she suggested one that in a community in Northern Ontario where she had worked, where there was a partnership between the artistic community and the police department, which certainly is out of the box, but certainly uh, not out of the realm of possibility. 
So that is it for the summary of tonight's event. Thank you for joining us and good night. Hi there, I'm Inga Petri uh, from Strategic Moves. Uh, I was part of a panel, um, I guess it was the seventh, uh, seventh session of this uh, awesome conference, uh, thinking about technological obstacles and how to turn those into technological opportunities. Um, I had the pleasure of spending the evening with Tammy Lee of Culture Create and Bryce Weinert of Museum Hack. Uh, my own work um, is best captured perhaps uh, through digital literacy work that I'm doing uh, across Canada, um, that, which is housed on a website called digitalartsnation.ca. Um, some of the highlights uh, from the conversation amongst the three of us, I think, were a few insights. One of them is, no matter what, it is best when technology follows strategy. Uh, technology is not a thing unto itself until it solves a problem that artists and arts organizations are having. So it's really, really useful to you know, for artists and arts organizations to first and foremost, figure out what it is that they want to do in the world. And then at this point in time, obviously we all had to figure out how the digital realm can, can be helpful in that regard. But, but never forget that technology should follow your needs, should follow your strategy of how you want to be in the world. There was also some comments that Bryce made uh, with regards to their work around, you know, live, events and museums and when they initially were faced with you know COVID having to simply figure out how to do that digitally they were initially just transposing the physical experience into the digital realm and they discovered quickly that that doesn't work um, so there are some insights around that you know when when we go digital we actually have to design for that and we have to figure out what digital is really good at and then implement that and to minimize some of the weaknesses it has. Um, we also had some conversation which I thought was interesting around this sort of digital being global, no longer being tethered to the specific particular geography, to the particular content in a particular museum, but being able to bring all kinds of um, new things into this digital space, including materials people have at their own houses. Uh, so that's a very different mindset. And I think, you know, later on, we also sort of talked about digital as intimate and digital as hyperlocal, which are some new ideas that really came out of the COVID experience. Um, Tammy's work, uh, if I may just talk a little bit about that, um, Tammy. Tammy's work is a lot about sort of, you know, big technology backend. So those are not necessarily things that an individual artist ever needs to do something about, but by doing that work, and I think the maybe the best website reference might be artsdata.ca for that, doing that work around developing sort of a repository of the knowledge attached to performing arts is something that is brand new and nobody's really tried to do that. Um, and so that's like leading work that's happening and we all should pay a little bit of attention to that. Um, but it's not necessarily something that individuals need to do something about, but we'll discover quickly that if we're part of that world, then places like Google and other sort of, you know, ways to interface with the web will start to use that information. Um, and the art sector itself, in fact, will be able to use some of that information as well. So, so there are some of those leading projects that are, that are happening. Um, the other, I think, idea that all three of us talked about a little bit was this idea that technology is not neutral. Technology has values and worldviews embedded in it. So there are a number of people in the country today uh, who are trying to take a, a, a more, a, a different view of that, uh, to try to make sure that we're not just sort of having an echo chamber um, happening around how recommendation engines work, for instance, or, you know, whose data is in fact captured and therefore whose data can be served up online, but that there are a number of uh, initiatives in place where we're really trying to figure out how to bring values around equity, uh, values around, you know, making more visible voices and experiences that may, that may not rise in the physical world. So there are those kind of opportunities digitally um, to, to bring that to the forefront, um, which, which I think is, is important and exciting. Um, I think the last thing I want to say for now is that uh, there was a bit of a conversation uh, amongst, uh, amongst us about the business model that comes with digital and that artists and arts organizations really need to think about whether free 
is a digital is, is can be a digital business model for them and i think the caution that uh that 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 sort of the conversation put up is is to say you know free works if you're a major platform taking your content for free <laughs> and and then monetizing on their on their side often through advertising that is the google model through google adwords uh that's essentially become the facebook model as well um and that there are now some projects underway where we're trying to put the artist in the driver's seat where most of the benefit from the from the artistic content creation in fact should go back to the artist and not just building the business model for a technology company. So that's also been sort of a concern that uh, that a number of us talked about um, and, and are motivated by uh, in some of the work that we're doing around technology. Uh, Tammy, uh, things to add from the from the conversation? Well, I think it was, you know, when we got to the question and answer period, it was a really lively discussion. I was really um, surprised that people were bored and they were right into it and they were asking questions and you know we went all over the place and we talked about the utility of websites and virtual reality and do i have to digitize my performances what can we do and i, and I think you know in that lively discussion we did come around full circle to say you know we're not trying to take away from the live performance but how do we leverage technology in the way that we need to today particularly, particularly um, the fact that we're all experiencing uh, COVID-19 lockdown. So, you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm for, I want to digitize my shows, I want to offer my offer online, but also questions about, well, what do I do with my live experience? It doesn't take away from the live experience. And, you know, questions came up and we talked about how we're all truly confident on, on how, what the artist can do for society. If they choose digital tools, yay, we're all there to support that. If they don't choose digital tools, we will support that as well. So, you know, what I liked about the conversation was it wasn't about the digitization of the performing arts, though that could be something that we could do. Um, but it was really just affirming the role of arts in society today uh, and using technology to help get that message out. Um, and we also had some practical questions about how can I make my website more findable? Is there a plugin that I can add into my Squarespace uh, website? So it was a wide range of like, you know, big picture questions and really practical questions. And, you know, great fun had by all. I mean, and that's what I have to say. If I can just add one more thing, I think part of where where the conversation was interesting is that the emphasis really ended up being on the connection between humans. And whether whether that is because we're in the same space physically or whether that is because we figured out how to create an awesome online experience of some sort using artistic skill sets. Right, but it's really that connection is at the heart of a lot of that, and that if we can achieve that, it's a win. Yeah, and uh, on that that note, it was really fascinating to hear what Bryce is doing at Museum Hack. So something that was so you know in person, and then figuring out how to provide that same sort of museum experience, but using technology and all the ways that they have innovated um, was actually. I think super fascinating for everyone to hear and uh, super motivating and highly inspiring for the artists that are out there. When a conference like this concludes, one of the questions to be asked is, what were we trying to achieve here and did we achieve it? One of the panelists asked me that question before the conference began and I answered that I saw three goals for the conference. First, to identify issues that we all share in the creative economy. Second, to broaden the horizons of participants in addressing those issues. And third, to inspire the creative community to rise to the challenge and find the path to success. At the end of the day, you'll be the judge of whatever of those goals was achieved. Now to wrap up this conference, let me invite 
the conference chair and chair of the Cultural Alliance in the heart of Georgian Bay, Cindy Hastings, to say a few words. Thanks, Fred. Uh, we'd like to again acknowledge our gratitude to the sponsors of this conference. The sponsors for this evening's session are CIBC and Midland Coffee Shop. Uh, thank you for making this evening's program possible. We'd also like to repeat our gratitude for the sponsors of our previous seven evenings, with special thanks to Simcoe County Tourism for their conference sponsorship and Rogers TV for their technical support. We hope that everyone has enjoyed the conference as much as we have. We are so proud of our five communities, mostly First Nations, Midland, Penetanguishene, Tiny and Tay. Uh, for having the vision to come together to create the Cultural Alliance, which then allowed us to bring you this exceptional programming. Uh, a special thank you to the mayors and the chief for their opening remarks at the beginning of the conference. This was a big undertaking. We are so grateful to many people that helped bring this amazing production to life. We had a small but mighty organizing committee uh, that began working on this since early summer. We'd like to thank Fred Hank Fred Hacker, uh, Karen Mealing, Kevin Kelly, John French, Faith Shergold, and Clayton King. I was honored to be chair of this committee, although Fred was really the captain steering this ship. I'd like to take a moment to offer special thanks to Fred, because I'm not certain he has left his office backdrop since we began the planning. He has been involved with every aspect of the conference, recruiting our talented panelists, developing topics, writing scripts, finding sponsors, and rehearsing. A huge thank you to you, Fred, uh, for your dedication and your passion for celebrating the cultural richness of our area. We are also extremely grateful to Kevin Kelly from Rogers TV, who put in countless hours to bring you this professional production. Uh, as we thanked him along the way, Kevin repeatedly told us that he was just doing his job. Um, but I would suggest uh, he has gone be above and beyond. Um, he's setting up Zoom conference, uh, testing for each of the eight sessions, monitoring, taping each of the eight sessions, more testing. Uh, we really couldn't have done it without his expertise and professionalism and without the support of Rogers TV. So a big thank you again to you, Kevin. Uh, thank you also to Karen Mealing, uh, who is our staff resource at the Cultural Alliance, uh, is with her hard work and support that we can see these ideas come to fruition. We're sure you all agree that our keynote Keynote speaker, panelists, and moderators were extraordinary. Our small conference rivaled that of much larger centers because of the level of expertise uh, brought by these contributors. We'd like to thank them all again for their contribution to the conference. And lastly, thank you to all of you, the members of the cultural or the creative community for your participation. We hope that you were inspired by the conference and you were able to take away some helpful nuggets of information that you can use in your future endeavors. Uh, thank you again, and back to you, Fred. Well, that concludes this conference. We'll be sending you one final survey to get your feedback on the event. We'd appreciate it if you take a few moments to complete it. Everyone who completes the survey will receive one ballot to be entered in a draw for a part of Georgian Bay prize package valued at $500. We hope you've enjoyed this creative Communities Culture Conference. On behalf of the Cultural Alliance in the heart of Georgian Bay, our moderators and our panelists throughout this month, and on behalf of our many sponsors and Rogers TV, I'm Fred Hacker. Thank you and good night. <laughs>